Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be looking at What If Altis' latest video and probably his boldest video to date, and I'm just judging that based on the title, How Our World and Age Will Collapse Very Soon. Now, when you're gonna put out a video that says, will collapse and add very soon, you know there's gonna be some massive claims in this video. So because of this, I'm gonna be doing this video a little differently. Usually I sit here and do the video in one take, maybe two takes, um, but this time I'm actually gonna be pausing and I'm gonna be looking up some information because I'd imagine that with a title like this, a very provocative title, there's gonna be some information that we might wanna look more into. So one thing to be clear is that this is not a debunking video. This is not where I'm gonna go through every claim or else it's gonna be an hour long and it's gonna take me like a week to research. Um, but I just wanna be pausing on things that just really don't sound right to me and look them up a little more. So without further ado, let's get right into it. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I would very much appreciate it. We're on our road to a thousand subscribers and we are almost there with 500. So if you could hit the subscribe button, I'd appreciate it. So without further ado, let's get into how our world and age will collapse very soon. Our age of history is about to end. The world that you and I have spent our entire lives in, upon which we've built our assumptions about how the world works, will end shockingly and markedly in the near future. This All will right. be a deeply traumatic process that will affect everyone on the planet and will, in its turmoil, set the stage for what the future will look like. In previous videos, I've talked about how, from looking at the historic record, it seems very plausible that the world order collapses. And in videos like this, I've gone through the underlying logic that propels it. Okay, I've it. checked out the second this one. This will be a video to talk about how it could possibly play out in Check details. that video out if you While going it. through the various interconnected factors that could contribute to it. Okay. Hell of an intro. If this is going to be a Raid Shadow Legends ad, I'm going to laugh. If you're a viewer of this channel, I suspect you spend a lot of time thinking about the future and potential conflicts that could arise. All right, guys. So while we're talking about how World War III is going to happen, make sure you play it on your mobile devices first in today's sponsorship. Oh, boy. All right. Let's keep going. Oh, did I hit Most play? people Just agree today that the international order is fundamentally unstable. That the trajectory okay. is built on foundations that are no longer operational, and the results of which we must see bear fruit. However, most people don't understand why this is happening on a beyond intuitive basis. The overarching answer is something I've covered before on this YouTube channel on a really, really frequent basis, so much so that I shudder to bring it up again. For more detail, this is a video I made explicitly about this topic. However, okay. you see these historic crashes every few centuries or so they are driven by demographic and economic factors, largely relating to inequality and overcompetition for labor, which results in social collapses. The last clear example of this in the Western world being the French Revolution, before that the crisis of the 17th century, which some historians think killed a third of the world's population, and before that the Black Death. But He's used this graph before, but one thing that's important to note here is that notice it only goes up to 1901, right? And this is a graph that's from 1966. So very key thing to always remember is that if you look at this graph, you go, okay, well, this is still applicable modern. This was made in 1966, right? So just saying. Do you find examples like this going back into the ancient world? Interestingly enough, there are a series of variables you can use to predict crises like this, including stuff like inequality, wage stagnation, rising real estate costs, the average age of marriage, moving beyond a certain range and the like. Okay. The epic historian Peter Turchin has made computer models that predict crises like the French Revolution, the fall of the Roman Republic, and the like, on the timescales they actually happened at. His computer said in around 2010 that America, and realistically much of the world by extension, would have a massive social crash in the 2020s. A, a massive social crash? So one man predicted a massive social crash in the 2020s through computer models. Okay, here comes the first claim. One sec. Okay, so after doing a bit of digging, I found that uh, Peter Turchin's blog here, and what he's referring to is cl Clio, sorry if I'm mispronouncing it, Clio Dynamics, but there's one important thing to talk about here. Well, Clio Dynamics is actually really interesting, and they've looked at previous data models to see how sort of in, uh, civilizations and how you can sort of make predictions, if you will. One key thing that he points out here is that Clio Dynamics is not about predicting the future. Right? And he makes a very specific point of talking about how scientific prediction is not the same as prophecy. Right? 
And you can even read right here, another one is, the United States will collapse in 2020. To my great amusement, there are reporters out there who claim that I uh, propounded such a pro uh, prophecy. For the record, I never said it. It might happen. Great empires did collapse in the past, and it's always true, it might happen. But the probability of such an event in the next 10 years, in my opinion, is pretty low. And even then, so this was written in 2013, so although we're going on, it's 2022 right now, and 2023 is next, to say, well, and this is what what if Haltist is great at. Yes, he's, he's, he's correct in a way, right? This, this data system does exist. But again, coming direct from the source here, it's not a prophecy. It's, it's not saying that America will collapse in 2020. It's that, okay, judging by the factors we have now, there's a possibility. However, and this is what the, this is what the, the team with Peter Churchin does, is that they said, here's how we can prevent it, right? So yeah, that's just, uh, that's just something that I found. So let's get back to the video. Really horrifying thing to keep in mind is that in almost all these crashes, you see combinations of external and internal wars, like the French Revolution with the Napoleonic Wars or World War I and the Russian Civil War. Again, though, those were wars caused because of wars. I think that's the point he's trying to make. But. The normal result is that one faction of the elite kills the other, since competition inside the countries becomes so great, something that people seem okay. to be working themselves towards in the modern world. Well, there's also major wars and plagues, sadly. These problems normally last a couple decades, like with the crises of the medieval and early modern periods taking around 50 years, while the crisis that came with the Napoleonic Wars lasted at least 20. However, something to consider is that if we're going to trust the Turchin data, the United States and China at even half the speed of the US move through this last cycle at twice the speed of the previous cycles you'd see in pre-industrial European history. Thus, I really don't know how long this kind of crisis would take, anywhere from a decade upwards. There okay, good. So at least that he said that. But as we just found out with what Turchin says is that it's not a prophecy, right? It's not to say that this will happen. It's that there's a possibility of it. And, and even though what if Altist, I'm going to take, you know, I'm obviously going to give him good faith here to say, yes, he probably knows that. Just the problem is that sometimes the way he presents it, he presents it as the inevitable, that this will happen, right? The title of the video is Will Collapse Very Soon, right? So let's keep going though. There's another interesting historian named Goldstein who is in this kind of work, who wrote what I consider to be the unreadable book of long cycles, <laughs> in which he found that major wars occurred with shocking clockwork across Western history. Also, writing in the 1970s, found a series of variables built up economics that predicted that there would be a major conflict in the world order between the U.S. and China in the year 2020. Okay, hold on. Again, so let's, let's have another quick look at this. You know what? I'm going to take a pause here again. Let's have a look at this one. Okay, so I found his, uh, his book on his website, joshuagoldstein.com. And already I went to the last chapter, which is called Future Projection. And within a few paragraphs in, right, we can see here that if long cycles were, were, were mechanistic, if long cycle dynamics did not change, if the world system did not evolve, then my prediction could, sorry, my projection could be a prediction. But long cycles are not mechanistic or deterministic, right? Thus, I'm empiric, I am emphatically not making a prediction, much less engaging in prophecy. The truth is that we make all projections of the future, consciously or unconsciously, all the time. My cyclical projection, however, tentative and rough, challenges the assumptions of the more conventional projections, which, okay, fair enough, right? So then we go down here and we see that uh, he predicts specifically, and one thing to note, this book was written in 1985. So that doesn't mean that it's not relevant or anything like this from an academic standpoint. However, it is important to note that you obviously have all the biases of the time and you have, you have asymmetry bias, right? Where you're looking at events that are happening right now and projecting them onto the future. So he says here that there will be a war upswing phase between 2000 slash 2005 to 2025 slash 2030. And he says specifically, this would put the highest danger of great power war. So we're gonna assume this is the six great powers or will of the, of the world sometime around the decade of the 2020s or almost 40 years in the future as of writing this. So already he did not say in the year 2020, which is what What If Altus just said, but rather in the decades of the 2020s. So you read that and you go, okay, fair enough. So let's look at the data here. 
from Our World and Data on War and Peace, and you can see that the, the number of active state-based conflicts, because we're going to use state-based, right? And you can see, obviously, there is quite a lot of civil conflicts, but the actual number of conflicts between states has been decreasing, right, since 1980. And within 2000, there were a whopping two number of state-based conflicts. And then between 2004, and although there was a mild one in 2008, to 2010, in 2008, I believe that was the invasion of... Um, of uh, oh my god sorry Crimea no that was 2014 what happened in 2008 I don't remember off the top of my head you can let me know in the comments um, right there's zero and so even if he says okay well it's going to happen in the 2020s right it's possible but we can see that the data over long periods of time have been getting lower and lower right and although we can just look at this as a trend we can obviously see that the amount of battle deaths is at its absolute lowest that it's ever been in human history. And this goes back to research done by Steven Pinker um, that says that we're living in the most peaceful period of our time, right? And you can see the visual history of decreasing war and violence um, throughout, throughout human history, right? And it says here, and we could, you can obviously go through this. I'll, I'll put a link in the description. If I don't, please, please remind me in the comments. Um, and violence overall is declining, right? The democratic governments are much less, much less likely to engage with wars in one another. And there is more democracy, right, continuing throughout the world. And although this is from 1995, it's still more democratic than it was before, right? At the beginning of the 20th century, 10% lived in dem democratic states. Literacy rates have gone up. So everything as per has been going up, which is not exactly pointing to the great power war of the 2020s. So again, this might be wrong, right? We're off, We're also taking trends from the past and applying them to the future. But it is still something important to point out that to say it isn't all doom. There's always a counter argument for things, um, you know, continuing on or even getting better into the future. So that's all I wanted to point out. Back to the video. Interestingly enough, from my own observation, at the start of every century, there's a major land-based aggressor to the balance of power, which is countered by a sea-based power, which constructs an international alliance against them and defeats the land-based aggressor power. Isn't Ch okay, this sounds like a perfect description of U.S.-Chinese relations today and how a war between them would likely really? play out. Thus, we know from the historic precedent that the world order could collapse okay. very easily, but... What are the current factors that could make this play out? How would some fancy crisis like this manifest in our real lives? All right, let's see what he says. There are several key triggers built inside the world system that if pushed would result in the collapse of the world order. Let's work through them. The first is the global financial system, which I made a video about here. This is oh the era of the highest money printing ever in world history. As a note, whenever we've got money printing this high historically, it always results in a social collapse. I'm not talking about a recession here, I'm talking about- Sorry, let me just- Wars and rebellions around the world. Then on top of that, compare by how much more the current money printing crisis is compared to any other era in history. The key problem here is that due to inequality, most young folks are barely getting by as is. And so if the standard of living is lowered even further, it'll breed further radicalism, dissent, and collapse. Wait, wait, wait. What was that chart? What is this chart? There's no year on it. Zero, 250%. Is this worldwide? Is this... What is this? There's no... Another good time to take a pause. One moment. Yet again, found the chart after doing some reverse Google uh, image searching. So price changes over the last 20 years prove that the economy is rigged. Very provocative title. This is from howmuch.net, which is a company that is about understanding money and also sells you insurance services. So always be sure on your sources first off. Let's not tip my mic over. So you can see here that what if Altist actually cut the chart off <laughs> right at zero to make things visually look worse than they are, right? And you can see that this comes here from 1998 to 2018. And so we can see hospital services, college tuitions, college textbooks. So that's really only two fields here. Child care uh, and medical care services are more expensive. Key thing to note here is that this is in the United States. This is not worldwide. And one thing, and I'm not getting into this, but 
health care costs in the United States are higher than anywhere else in the world. And maybe it's higher in somewhere like China or something. I don't know. But that and your college tuition is also the most expensive in the world. So if we look at these other metrics here, we can see that uh, telecommunication services is going down, staple goods, right? Um, computer services, toys, I don't know how you would define that, but whatever, televisions, housing. Uh, housing has actually been relatively keeping up with average hourly earnings. Now, this is just one chart, and that's one that I, I immediately go in my head, okay, that doesn't sound quite right, but we'll keep it at that. And food and beverages as well. Right. And it looks like that this chart was um, influenced by this gentleman here who made this chart as well, which, again, he has housing actually slightly higher. Um, and this has overall inflation between 1998 and 2018. Right. So at an inflation rate of 56 percent. Yeah, OK. It, obviously, it is a fact that things get more expensive and inflation is an issue. And I agree with what if all is. But to sort of present this chart is to say, well, this is but a collapse, right? When you cut it off at the zero point and you don't give the hours, sorry, the years, and you don't give where in the world it is, then it's that's pretty biased towards it, right? And all these other things are getting cheaper. I mean, I could just as easily cut out this here and say, look at how much everything is getting more affordable over time, right? It's just as easy to. So... There you go. That's that's one thing. And just another thing is that inflation, right? Uh, $100 in 1997 is 156 in 2018. So inflation obviously has a, has a role to play in this too. So let's get back to the video. Need further radicalism, dissent, and collapse. Just look at the events like January 6th or the Chaz rebellions, and then imagine that magnified across the globe. The horrifying thing is that it looks like the elite is... Of course, he picked Nancy Pelosi and not any Republican, but I digress. Totally disconnected from the real population, as we've seen through many countries' different COVID policies. I mean, the Biden administration literally said it would respond to inflation by printing more money. I th okay, hold on. Already, the Biden administration said, outright said, that they're going to respond to inflation by printing more money. All right, I didn't even get 20 seconds, and now i got to look something up else up again. All right, so we have this news article here from NPR, which NPR, I'd consider them to be a pretty good source. This is from January 18th, 2022. The movement to stick inflation blame on Biden. Okay, so another key thing here too is that I don't want to get into party partisan politics. There's, that's not my point I'm trying to make here. But the main point that I'm trying to find is that to say that inflation is solely to blame on one person. And this goes for if you just blame Donald Trump for one single thing, or Obama or, or Bush for this and, and Obama for that and Clinton for this. It's more complicated than that, right? The, the article here notes that, where is it exactly? Right, so last week, new, re, new data revealed that the European Union set a record high inflation of 5% in December, right? The highest in its 20 year history. Canada is also seeing the highest rate of inflation in two decades. Same with South Korea, Turkey and the United Kingdom. So if they're saying if what he's pr proposing is the Biden inflation saying they're going to print more money to tackle inflation, that w that's not exactly what happened, right? There was the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, which it notes here, right, was also um, massive federal spending packages to provide rel relief from COVID began under President Trump and initially had bipartisan support, Right. So you can see here that it's not just it's not as simple as like, oh, well, the Biden administration is saying that they're going to print more money to respond to inflation because that just sounds stupid and it just makes people mad. But when you look more into it, right, whether you agree with a one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan, fine, that's up for debate. There's there's pros and cons to it. And sure, fair enough. Right. But to present the message of saying, yeah, Biden said this, that we're just going to print more money to tackle inflation. It's just a bad faith argument. Right. So, yeah. And inflation is happening everywhere. As I'm in Austria right now, I've noticed the prices between September and here. So it's not just a uniquely U.S. phenomenon and nor is singularly Joe Biden to blame for it or Trump or Obama or anything like this. These decisions are made by multiple people. All right. Back to the video. 
So I didn't get a chance to go to this, but I, I like what he says here. I genuinely do. The, the, this is the way to respond to inflation is to raise interest rates, which makes it more difficult for businesses to take on debt, which means they hire less people so that employment goes up. And stagflation is that what happened in the 1970s that blew economists out of the water is that inflation was high and unemployment was high, right? And so that is what very oversimplified stagnation is and no matter what you do whether you try and stagnate wages to lower inflation or you increase inflation and lower employment rate it is a lose-lose situation so i'm glad that he put this in here that thus having either high inflation or high unemployment is manageable but having both is terrible right and no matter what you do you're you're going to lose in some manner I think we'll look forward to stagflation or high unemployment and high inflation, a really bad combination for economists and governments since responding to one of those basically makes the other one worse. Exactly. I can make this sound like a purely American problem, which it really is. Most that. I'm governments around that. the world are printing money at very high rates. And in China, the problem is by far the worst of anywhere in the world. This degree of money printing has negative effects on all of society, but these are made most manifest in China. For example, inflation tends to result in housing prices going through the roof since people invest in real physical assets that don't lose value like the money does. However, this has resulted in China having some of the highest home-to-wage cost ratios of anywhere in the world, leaving the average Chinese person with no chance of basically supporting a family or moving into a comfortable middle age. At the same time, economic crashes tend to hit the third world very hard given that they're True. often very dependent upon wealthier markets for exports or capital. Thus, it wouldn't surprise me if an economic crash, starting in China or the U.S., would promulgate state collapses and collapses in order in the third world. And this is another thing, too, is like state collapses, whole state collapses. We went through 2008. We've been through recessions. It's, it's, it's a matter. It, it's going to happen. Recessions always happen. We'll have another one, too, after this one. It's inevitable. Right. Arguably, it can be a healthy thing for the economy, too, if it contracts in a in a healthy manner. And again, I am not an economics person, but this is just from what I know. But to say that whole state collapses. OK, sure, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say maybe in very, very unstable regions. Sure. But still, when you say that uh, and you don't specify which states or anything like this, it makes it sound like. The Canadian government is going to collapse, the German government is going to collapse, etc. As an update to the video I released on why I thought we'd have an economic crash a year ago, in many ways it's become common knowledge among people in the know, where many people just assume the market will crash now. As yeah, an example of this, happen. I'm sure some of you have seen the famous update from tech startup accelerator Y Combinator telling their startups to basically prepare for the end times. I could have... <laughs> Again. <laughs> and this is... and this is, I think this is the thing that... The, bugs a lot of people about what a fault is if it bugs you let me know in the comments is that yes that is correct right we're we're preparing for hard times ahead true that is that's a fact but then the problem is is that he messages it and says the end times the end times right to, to use to invoke a biblical reference it's just it's it comes down to the messaging right we we went through 2008 i mean the, the amount of debt that was present in mainland europe in after world war ii right we'll we'll get through it right and just it's it's the it, i think it's the language it reminds me of when i was his age and he's 21 years old he said that in one of his uh, i think it's the 10 facts that no society can or sorry no society can answer 10 questions or something but i remember when i was and i and i'm 26 so i'm only five years older than him which is not that much but like, I remember the same thing during 2015 and 2017. I had all these wild predictions that would happen too. And now sitting in 2022, it's like, yeah, it kind of happened, right? I thought I was talking about right-wing populism and Russia, right, being way more aggressive. I thought they would have went for like Georgia and Azerbaijan and stuff. And so again, it's like, yeah, kind of true. Right. And I thought, you know, that Germany would be run by the AFD and, and France would Marine Le Pen would have won and all these things. But mildly true, the AFD did come into power in 2018, right, as a third largest power, uh, sorry, the third largest party. But they didn't just take over Germany and make it into this, you know, authoritarian state. So 
told you all of that stuff before, but the Ukraine war has further pushed this inevitable crisis forward, promulgating a couple sticking points that will tear the world system apart. The biggest and scariest mm. is food. This is something that Peter okay. Zihan, who is one of the most respected people in the geopolitics industry, has been saying for a long time, but I really didn't believe him until I started to see what happened in the aftermath of the Ukraine war. I thought this is the era of the highest agricultural productivity ever by a vast margin in which yeah, there are nearly true. three times as many fat people in the world as hungry. It's a <laughs> Okay. <well. laughs> Saying there's more fat people. Okay, whatever. But yes, he's definitely right. The most productive in terms of agriculture. Impossible for places to starve. Well, one of the things I've realized living life is that God is often cruel, but he always has a sense of humor. If the data is correct, we might see the largest famine in history in the next 10 years or so. Yeah, so I like what he wrote here, is that I often say this will be the biggest in history, which is pretty easy, easy given how much populations have grown. And he notes here, there are more total people in slavery today, which is, that's a, that's a whole other video, and that's a very, very fascinating topic and very sad topic, if you ever want to look into that, than in 1800. Even the percentages are much lower given the world's population was just 1 billion. The thing is that Russia and Ukraine are some of the biggest grain exporters in the world, and much yeah. of Africa and the Middle East, or the top food importing areas in the world, are totally dependent upon them. Both Russia and Ukraine have stopped exporting gra calorie import dependent grain to the war. Much of the third world is operating on grain reserves that won't hold until the okay. winter, in which there is basically no one to export grain to. One of the biggest factors that's getting very little attention is that the nitrogen and fertilizer network, of which Russia and Ukraine are truly massive linchpins, alongside with supply problems in Canada, mean that much of the third world won't mm, be getting fertilizer this year. This might not sound like a big deal to most normal people, but it's honestly the biggest deal in the world. The reason that the world's population is four times what it was during World War II, but we're all better fed, was due to the massive rises in agricultural productivity since then, True. concentrated yep. in third world countries. Yeah, I mean, the, and the techniques too, the difference in agricultural techniques. Uh, when I was in Israel, I got to visit a farm. We visited a farm when we were there, and I also did in the UAE too. And just the techniques that they have now, the amount of modern technology that they have for growing um, plants is, is really outstanding. If you ever get a chance to visit a farm in your local area, go do it. It's actually really interesting. Just Africa has seen a five times over growth in population as an example. At the same time, lots of these third world countries have poor supply networks, which means that if one bolt falls loose, farmers won't even <laughs> be able to get the fertilizer by truck anyway, thus meaning that the crops people depend on won't be grown at all. At the same time, the other main agricultural powers are having problems. The United States, one of the world's agricultural juggernauts, is seeing its own supply problems that will make this harvest really depressed. The supply chain just isn't operating properly to see proper mm -hmm. agricultural And a lot of that comes down to COVID, too. ...cultural outputs that you would need. At the same time, this has been a really terrible harvest in the upper Midwest, where American agriculture is concentrated. Okay. sure. The U.S. won't starve. It's a massive food exporter, and so it'll just keep selling food abroad. But this would in turn have horrible and deleterious effects in the rest of the world, which is dependent upon American grain. And again, what would a collapse in world agriculture do? And it, it's not, it doesn't look to be a collapse. But he also said the Arab Spring was partially caused by a rise in grain prices. Again, all these things play a little part, but to say that the Arab Spring happened because of grain, uh, because of grain prices rising, grain prices are rising again, so we're gonna have another Arab Spring. It's a very, what would you say, descriptive look at history. Meanwhile, if you look at Latin America, where the other agricultural titans like Argentina and Brazil reside, we see similar problems where the modern anti-agricultural parties are making it very difficult for those nations to expand agricultural production abilities, thus making them unable to fill the gap in global agriculture. Of all the problems here, okay. food is the one I'm least certain of. If the war in Ukraine stops soon and we return to a peaceful world, it seems possible to patch everything up. Also, it does seem possible that the Americans could just make up the slack as the price of global food goes up, just not to dangerous levels. I think these worries could be overhyped. However, a point you yeah, can't okay, fail to enough. emphasize is that if this does go wrong, it will go wrong by this winter, meaning we have less than six months where the world would go to shit. Amid less than six months? Okay, so it's July now. The world would go to shit, okay. Major pressure going. point connected to this is oil. The modern oil market is possibly the best orchestrated thing in the world, spanning continents and oceans, operating at remarkably low costs. 
However, it's very easy to disturb. Just look at how the Russia and Ukraine war was able to result in doubling the price of international oil. However, if we're adding in massive food problems in the Middle East, one of the largest food importers in the world, upon which the old world is dependent on oil from, we'd see mass shutdowns of oil production in the area, which would further skyrocket the price of oil. This would hurt East Asians disproportionately, the area of the world most dependent upon foreign oil. However, oil is so integral to the global economy that to raise its price by a large margin would result in massive untold global implications and problems. Okay. Which brings us to a grim piece in this puzzle, China. Talked about in this video, China <laughs> really doesn't look like it's in a good position. Like I think everyone in the world, and I'm betting even the Communist Party here, I honestly don't have a good understanding of what's going on in China right now. However, after two months of brutal lockdowns driven by a desire to suck up to Xi, to summarize in bullet points, Xi has built his honor <laughs> off defeating COVID, and fair. yet he is opposed by various uh, internal factions yeah. in China, and thus has been pushing really horrible lockdown policies to show his power and cower his opponents. This has resulted in a nasty and messy process in which the rules get enforced on different local bases, which has resulted in things as horrifying as Chinese farmers not seeing their next harvests, thus opening China up for starving next year, cities shutting down brutally, provinces cutting each other off totally from interprovincial trade, effectively stranding China into thousands of little regions. Bru Again, damn, heck of a prediction to say that it's going to be starving. And so that's the thing that doesn't make any sense, is he just said that food is the thing that he's most uncertain about. And he says that the global supply chain and everything is so well interconnected, even though there are problems to it. And there's major delays to the supply chain because of COVID. Again, a fact, right? But then he just he spins it a little bit and say, OK, well, then this means that there is an impending collapse in China due to starvation in which we will see warlords. And, 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 right, and that's the thing that, that bothers me, right? He's obviously a well-read individual. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. But it's that little spin, right, into the prediction that that's what bugs me. Brutality in many areas is the norm. Whether people starving during COVID lockdowns, being welted into their apartments and the like. They are literally doing everything they would be doing if they wanted to establish a horrifying militaristic totalitarian state. They've shut off Chinese from visiting foreign countries, they've banned studying foreign languages, they're stockpiling food and oil and raw materials, okay. they're massing an army to attack Taiwan, they are posting extremely aggressive nationalist propaganda and saying in their party mouthpiece newspapers they want to have a war with America. A reason China is being so aggressive is its aging crisis. This is again something I've talked <laughs> about more ad nauseum before in previous videos, but yeah. the world's aging crisis is about to profoundly start disturbing nations. The world's population in many countries is about to have over the next 60 years, in including China, Russia, Germany, or Japan. If we look at the effects of what these sort of things have already happened in Japan, the oldest country in the world, we're looking at how Japan went from being the most okay. innovative country in the world to having seen basically no economic growth for 30 years. A wave that would destroy their societies with decreased ability for the young to make businesses, have kids and the like, which would just make the problem worse. In places like China or Russia, this will destroy their governments, which is why they're being so aggressive now. This brings you to the final point here that all of- I've already done this in a video, so I'm just gonna let them go through this one. Uh, if you haven't seen my Wars of the 2020s video, Go check that one out. This adds up to geopolitical instability that acts as a factor in of itself. I've talked about it so many times on this show before, while at the same time it's so complicated that it's difficult for me to talk about. However, the world is full of aggressive, unstable powers that look to expand outwards as a way of justifying their existences. There are two arcs of instability to keep track of in the future. The first roughly corresponds to the Iraq? former Mongol Empire, but is really the sphere okay. of the Russian-Chinese alliance against Sri the rest Lanka? of the world. On every edge of this sphere is a potential hotspot that could result in a major war between the great powers. Examples include Ukraine, Syria, Iran, North Korea, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, and the like. I have no idea which of these could possibly trigger the fire. The second arc of instability is the area with food and water instability if things go bad, which stretches from Africa into Central Asia. This is a region that will just go insane and fall apart if the world goes to shit since they can't feed their own people. Between these two separate arcs, the area where the collapse of the world is most likely to start is the Middle East, which is the easy answer, and is to our modern world system what the Balkans were to World War I, an unstable area of ethnic tension that the great powers were involved in with local alliances. 
All right. So it's begins. hard to predict a real path for what could possibly happen. <laughs> As I've said time and time again on this YouTube channel, my job is basically betting against God. So the chances of anything I could possibly tell you happening is pretty low. But this is a scenario that I think is pretty possible. And, and again, so within a week, I don't remember I'm doing in that one, but right, something like this, that infl inflation would continue to go through the roof, that Germany would meet militarily rearm. I think we've all in some way had these predictions before that Russia would immediately win the Ukraine war. I think a lot of people thought that one would annex Belarus in 2021. That's news to me. Egypt and Ethiopia would have a war. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, as Wayne Gretzky said, but, you know. I mean, we've gotten predictions both right and wrong on this channel, so we'll just have to see what happens. I think it's pretty plausible we see a financial crash this summer. The American and Chinese economies are so intertwined they'd collapse sure. in pretty close unison with the other. Maybe the Chinese government would try to play some sort of trick to try to go back to Maoist times, where recessions <laughs> don't matter, but that would just result in a revolution. However, as stated before, this would also result in a worldwide recession, with stagflation or a nasty combination of rapid inflation and high unemployment, and thus we would see a collapse in real living wages. The US dollar, which has been artificially propped up by foreign governments, would show the true value that it is after all the money printing that's happening, thus resulting in horrible results for the standard of living of the American people. The reason I'm putting this summer as a potential point for this crash okay. to happen is because if we're starting with the assumption that there would be mass famine and state collapse in the third world by the time we hit the fall, stuff like that... By the time we hit the fall, all right. I can't wait to watch this video again. It doesn't in six normally months. just immediately happen out of the blue. And there's normally a series of events that presage or foreshadow it or ramping up of worse and worse events. And so it makes sense if you see state collapse after a financial crash that would happen the summer before. With all this going on, Saudi Arabia or Iran collapse in a revolution. The other. Saudi Arabia or Iran, you've heard it here, folks. Heard it, heard it here first, folks will collapse in a revolution this summer or next. Okay. Another country now tries to intervene in the other country's political crisis, thus creating extra drama in the Middle East, which since we're talking about the Middle East here, becomes basically impossible to predict because there's like 30 factions that all hate each other. Didn't you just predict something? China does something big at this point. I'd posit around November when they're going to start having food problems. November. Basically, All they right. either Mark invade Taiwan calendars. or fall in a revolution. What either of these happens is hard to say, but here are some videos in which I go into more of the details. If there is a war between China and India or the US, it would be the greatest conflict in history, possibly roping in Europe and Russia becoming a World War III, even though, as I talk about in this video, I think a World War III is possible over the next couple decades, but I don't think it's the most likely option, with the most yeah, likely no. conflict being something like the Thirty Years' War, or a series of proxy, indirect, long-form wars. Yeah, that's, that's the more likely Russia and China opinion. probably wouldn't win these conflicts. Every century, we see the 20-year or so conflict where the land-based power tries to challenge the sea-based one, and the sea-based one wins by building the strongest coalition, and this fits perfectly for the situation. At but then what about Japan? If he's bringing up World War II, then what about Japan? Japan is a sea-based power. Japan is entirely a sea-based power. The country of Japan is an island. So that hypothesis doesn't really fit <laughs> with with the other... Well, Japan was not a part of the Axis, but with the other member of the Axis, if you will. Uh, so, okay, well, that theory doesn't really work. At the same time, the Russians, who are the key Chinese ally, have performed really poorly in Ukraine. And yeah, as true. well as that, China's reaction to COVID and their latest lockdowns is also showing a lack of cohesion and corruption, probably weakening their military. And on top of that, okay. Russia and China are both seeing collapsing populations. So in a conflict like this, I think the U.S. would probably end up winning with its coalition. After... Again, and I talked about this in the video, but the whole Russia-China-US war, it's just, it's the end times. Because again, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons, right? That's always what it comes down to. And nuclear, if you have wars between great powers with the amount of nuclear weapons that have, that, that we have now, that is why there has not been a war between great powers since World War II. That was the last time. That there was a war between great powers, between nuclear weapon um, holding powers. And that is just one thing that is just 
not brought up in these videos and it's frustrating to me. Words due to supply, right? The whole Cold War was about this. <laughs> problems in the population collapses that would be bearing fruit, driven even further by more young people dying in wars and struggles, we would see much of Eurasia collapse into a horrifying warlord period. The worst part of this crisis would happen now, in next winter, with if yeah. grain oh, and okay. agriculture goes as bad as is possible, Africa and the Middle East would have mass famine, killing tens of millions at least. Tens of millions. And this is, and he said before, though, that food production is one of the things that he's least certain about. And with the integrated supply chain, look, I've talked about it ad nauseum at this point. This video is getting long. Let's keep going. Let's finish it up here. Many people will try to flee across the Mediterranean to Europe only True to have right. Europe True. strongly turn against immigration and shoot migrant boats in the water. Shoot migrant boats. Okay. However, we would see state collapses in much of the area. With nations falling apart in Africa and the Middle East, you're replaced by more primal organizations, normally built off ethnicity, or religion, or the charisma of a great leader taking the four. Politics becomes extremely polarized in the area that continues to function to a certain degree like the US, Western Europe, or India. You okay. would probably see the government have trouble carrying out its orders with, say, many cities in America being controlled by left-wing gangs Well, What? With many cities in America being controlled by left-wing gangs? <laughs> okay, they're fun. All right, guys. So coming to you next summer is uh, left-wing gangs marauding through your city, plundering and looting. Oh my God. Okay, that's 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 really really dumb to to hypothesize that that's going to happen. Right-wing militias would be skirmishing them in suburbs. Right-wing militias skirmishing. All right, so we just have the complete collapse of American civilization by this time next year or by this summer or whenever because the timeline there was not clear. So because of food instability, we're going to have left-wing and right-wing gangs clashing each other in the streets. I, I actually don't even have words. I, I actually do not have words. Type a comment below for what you think, because, wow. Well, the government is unclear about what it should do lest it cause a civil war. However, over time... America's not going to come into a civil war, guys. I mean, in all of these areas, politics gradually switches to the right as a reaction to the historically left-wing post-World War II order. The worst possible, but... Again, he already talked about that in the thing before, but there's, there's not a clear dichotomy between left and right in the post-World War II order. Still out there option is these countries becoming military dictatorships. I make this sound horrible, and don't get me wrong, it is. However, I'd like to have the ending I normally have. That's that ridiculous. That if we can get through this, it'll be worthwhile. Almost always, the greatest golden ages follow the worst struggles. The 50s couldn't exist without World War II and the Augustan Golden Age after the Roman Civil War. I can tell you what will end, but I can't tell you what will come next. What kinds of music, economic innovations, and the like will come out of fruition of these struggles, as they always do. Chaos breeds order and vice versa, forming a beautiful nexus that is creation. And the fact that our times might see some of the greatest chaos will also mean we'll see some of the most beautiful creations of order afterwards. When you're old and telling your grandkids at how you spent your life, do you want to have been in the generation who fought in the world wars or who lived in the 80s? Whoa, I want to pause right there. There's no glory in, in, in dying in wars, right? That's very clear. If you would rather be living in the 1980s and you talk to anyone who's ever fought in a war before, they would much rather live in the 1980s than they would have been the people that fought World War II. And that's the reason why we, ad we admonish and we admire the people that fought World War II, because the millions, the tens of millions of men, women, and children that died that perished in this conflict. Uh, sorry to take this very serious note, but I do. But that's something very important: is that you cannot glorify the absolute sheer amounts of human suffering that happened. You do not want that. You would much rather live in the '80s and be a part of, of peaceful times. You might be talking about something like decadence, but. That always, that oh, whenever I hear that, it always rings a bell for me. So if you, I mean, go check out the video I did on the fallen of World War II and you can just see the tens of millions of those that sacrificed their lives for peace, which is what the 80s generally was. So 
I can't offer you anything except glory in a story worth telling. Would have felt it. Yeah, glory. Okay, well, that was that. Uh, wow, that last two minutes marauding left-wing gangs throughout cities clashing with right-wing militias. Wow. Okay, so that was the new format. Let me know how you guys liked it. Uh, I'm just taking a pause here and there to look up some stuff. Again, not a debunking video. Not going to get into the whole long-form research. There were, there were a couple things there about China that probably would warrant further research. But let me know what you guys thought below. Feel free to write a comment. I'm looking forward to the, to the debate and the discussion on this video. And I will see you guys in the next one. And hopefully it won't be such a doomer one. Maybe we'll talk about World War II or something. Something historical. Something more, yeah, more historical. Okay. See you guys then.